Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our new virtual conversation series that we call the Harvest Leaders Sit Down Series. And it's really, it's one of the things that we do to help you harvest your potential. In this case, it's your leadership potential. I'm Cindy Code, and I'm your moderator for today's conversation. In this new series, we, the harvesters, take you beyond the headlines. We take these in-depth interviews, um, conversational questions, live questions during the series, and we really want to bring some terrific information that will help you run your businesses. So today, Harvester Ed Laflamme is going to interview our friend, Roger Braswell, industry veteran and entrepreneur. Welcome, Roger. Thank you. Thanks. At the young age, and you're going to hear all about this, but at the young age of 14, Roger knew exactly what he wanted to do. He wanted to work in the landscape industry. He jumped right in with both feet, and he hasn't looked back. I mean, talk about passion and dedication. Roger has not only been successful in the landscape services industry, but he's also responsible for bringing the first compact utility loader to the market way back in the late 90s, I believe, called uh, Dingo. So I was just remembering the other day, I worked at Lawn and Landscape Magazine at the time, and the editorial team at Lawn and Landscape did an editorial supplement. We loved doing this with, with new equipment, and the Dingo was what we, what we wrote about. And once that, this is back in the 90s, to so remember, once it was distributed, there was so much interest in the Dingo, the company, Roger's company, ran out of fax paper. <laughs> trying, <laughs> trying to handle, that was fax. Again, you know, I'm dating myself. But I mean, that was that was so exciting at the time. And, and following the Dingo, after that was sold to Toro, you know, Roger's next initiative was the launch of Compact Power, Inc. And uh, he, he does so much more in the industry. But as dedicated Roger is to the landscape industry and the power equipment in, in industry, he's also devoted to a good number of charities, including Give Hope Global. So you'll hear a little bit about that today. So Roger and Ed have a lot to talk about, and we hope to hear from you too. So you know, please write your questions in the chat box on your screen, and we'll get to as many of those as we can during the interview and then some at the end. And before we start, we'd like to thank both Verizon Connect and Boss LM for their partnership of our Harvest webinar series. So I think that's all the housekeeping. Remember to ask your questions. Um, we're excited to have you all here today. So Ed and Roger, take it away. Awesome, thank you, Cindy and Roger. It's so great that you've taken the time to, to be with us for this next hour. My pleasure, Ed. I'm excited about spending the time with all of my industry friends. I see a couple have already written me a note there. Thank you, Don and Kurt. And so it's great to, uh, to be on board with you this afternoon. Now, Roger, you sold that business for how much money? $265 million. Did you ever think you would have done something like that at 14 years old? At 14, I didn't exactly have that in mind, but the, <laughs> but I certainly worked hard to make that happen. And and to be okay. clear, you Is know, between, working, between, the bank, between the bank and my partners, I didn't walk away with any number like that. <laughs> Is know. he blushing, folks? Huh? <laughs> it wasn't a bad. It wasn't a bad day, Ed. Well, I tell you, that was fantastic. So tell me, where were you raised, Roger? So I grew up uh, just outside of Charlotte in a little town called Mint Hill, North Carolina. And I uh, was living there when I started my business in 1968. Uh, so yeah, just right here. I'm, I'm a native of Charlotte and I'm a rare native at that. Yeah, for sure. And, and um, Cindy, said, Cindy said that you started your, um, uh, your, your landscape company, you were 14 when you started working as a landscaper. And I understand you bought a truck when you were 15, but how did you drive it? Well, I couldn't drive it by myself. I had a learner's permit. So if my mom rode with me, I was in good shape. But uh, I had to hire a driver for, for normal you know, business activity. So I had to hire someone who had a driver's license. One requirement, work hard and drive a truck. You know, some things never change. <laughs> That's the requirement today, right? Yeah. So your parents helped you right from the start. Yeah, well, in that way, I, I uh, my dad gave me his 22-inch push mower, <laughs> and I bought a pickup truck and a riding mower, 
And when I left home a couple of years later, I left dad the riding mower so he could at least mow his grass with that. But Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Why did you pick landscaping or did it pick you? I think it picked me, Ed. Actually, uh, after school and on weekends, I worked for a small landscape nursery in the neighborhood. And uh, the, the owner had a master's in horticulture and really taught me a lot and got me interested in the in the business. And so kind of going from that one dollar and thirty five cents an hour job, by the way, which was what I got paid a buck thirty five uh, to um, say and saved all that money, paid two fifty for the pickup truck and put a hundred dollars down on the riding mower. And my dad co-signed the note at the bank and and I was off and running, put an ad in the newspaper. I remember I got the first uh, uh, response to the ad, went out, priced the job at eight dollars to mow the guy's grass. He said an immediate yes. And I thought two things. A, I priced it too cheap, but B, I'm sure I'm going to make a lot of money doing this. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that like it was yesterday. That's often, yeah, yeah I, you, that's happened to me too. I know what you mean. Yeah. Let me ask you something. You, you've done a lot. We're going to talk a little bit about it. What drives you? Oh gosh. So um, that's, that's, that's a deep question, but I'll make my best run at it, Ed. So, um, you know, that's a different answer today than what it would have been at 15 or at 25 or 35 or 45. I'm, I'm 68. And I would say that, you know, at least since I started the work in Haiti, which was nine years ago in 2012, I, um, I learned that there is, uh, you know, a lot of things in life that are more important than money, but money helps you accomplish some of those things. So it's good, good to make it along the way and, and be wise about it. But, uh, so I've come to believe that we're playing an infinite game. That that word for that is not, you know, not, not original with me. Simon Sinek talks about it a good bit. The fact that companies that believe they're playing an infinite game and that their number one objective is to stay in business. And, uh, and they're not just looking about trying to, to, uh, to reach a certain point and go out of business, et cetera, are the ones that, that, that have the best businesses and the best cultures and, and really are the most successful. And our lives, if we recognize that we're, we're playing a game that's gonna really, the impact will last long beyond our time on the planet, then it sort of changes the context and how you look at things. So, so now I'm, I'd say I'm driven by uh, trying to leave a legacy for my grandsons and granddaughter and, and, um, and those people that I care about and love and, and trying to make an impact that will last beyond my time here. So hope, hopefully, the, you know, I'll be blessed to be able to have some success at that. We'll see. You, you've had a lot of success in, in starting companies and then selling them. Yeah. And what, what got you involved in some of these companies? Why, why did you buy the, the nursery? Why did you start out with that? So, um, uh, so I, I guess what got me started with it, I, I started off and, uh, and built my own landscape business. And then I had an opportunity to buy a, a tree business when I was 24. And uh, the, the gentleman who started the company, which was the Southern Shade Tree Company, had started it in 1954. And I bought it in December of 76. So 32 years, uh, 22 years later. And... Uh, I was 24. He agreed to finance it. The, the bank loaned me some money to operate it. And, you know, then so I bought the business. I never really, you know, woke up one day and said, I'm going to buy a company, but it, it kind of found me. And so I did that. Uh, and then I ran that business long and hard and started some other offshoots in other markets and, and then sort of met the guys uh, who, who were thinking about doing the land care uh, publicly traded roll up. And so I became a founder in that. And, uh, and then, as you know, we bought a lot of companies and I was on the kind of acquisition side of that, did a lot of due diligence and company buying. And so that opened up that world for me and, and kind of the idea of buying and selling businesses. And so then I had a good number of opportunities after that to, uh, to have both divestitures and acquisitions and, in both industries, the landscape and the equipment side. So I, I remember when uh, <clears throat> I remember you had the tree company. I remember being down in your your yard and I saw that new machine down there I'd never never seen before called a dingo. How in the world did you get involved with that? 
you know, just uh, divine, divine providence, I think. Although, you know, um, it was a point in time in which I wasn't sure who had inspired it because it, it was more difficult than I imagined. But um, so I ran into uh, the Australian manufacturer at a nursery trade show in North Carolina in Winston-Salem in January of 95, saw the machine. I remember walking up to the eight, it's a little eight by 10 booth and kind of getting the hair on the back of my neck standing up as I saw this thing and I thought, wow, that's going to change. That's going to change how we do some stuff. And so uh, he brought it out, uh, demoed it. Some of my guys said, forget about it. Others said, Hey, that's pretty cool. We had a job with 2000 street trees to plant and, uh, I could see that 24 inch auger. We eventually put a 30 on it going into the ground to dig those holes for all those holly trees. And I thought, man, I'll pay for it on the first job. So I bought it for my own use. And then I tried to negotiate to get the North and South Carolina rights to it. And somehow you misunderstood and I ended up with North and South America. <laughs> that's a great mistake. Yeah. So that's how that happened. <laughs> that's amazing. I and didn't your brother help you with that? He did. My my older brother, Rick, who was a genius with with equipment operation and, and maintenance and management and, and fabrication, uh, had, a, had a, a quite a good career with a large masonry contractor, left it to come help me start that since deceased, but was, was a great partner in that business for me. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. And then you negotiated right away with, uh, pretty soon after that, with Toro, didn't you? That's right. That was, we started in 95 and then, and sold to Toro in 97. So two years oh, later. That's faster than I thought. I, I, I always thought you had it longer than that, but. Uh, well, I, I, I helped Toro launch it for several years after that. So, uh, so by the time you would have been at my tree farm, we had already partnered with Toro to launch it and we were demoing and selling on their behalf. They were manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then from there you went to, uh, uh, you you moved on to start your own uh, the Compact Power uh, company, correct? Yeah, that, that's right. So uh, I got involved with a company in Oklahoma called um, Merch Manufacturing that was making the Boxer, and yep. then with a competitor in Australia making the Kanga. And this was after Toro and I had had moved on, and and they were doing their thing. And so I got rights to both of those products, and and had. Um, uh, private label rights to both products. So we hmm. sold them under the Boxer and Kanga brands and also private label a brand called Power, Powerhouse that we sold to the, to, the, um, to the Home Depot for their rental market. And then as that business really took off, we, uh, we formed Compact Power to, um, uh, to end up being in the rental business ourselves in a partnership with the Home Depot where we provided the equipment and, and they provided the yard to put it on. And now, so, at that point, you, you didn't have your landscape company then, did you? <clears throat> well, you know, so I had uh, been a part of going public with land care and my business was in that with the exception of my my nursery and, and uh, tree farm, which I had kept out of that arrangement. And so back in uh, 2001, after my non-competes with uh, land care had expired, my, uh, my partner in the and the tree business got back into the landscaping business. So the Southern shade tree company then began doing full service landscaping again in the early 2000s. So I was not active in it. I was fully active in compact power, but I was a, I was a part owner and still am of Southern shade tree company. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. And so then from there, I understand you, you went to home Depot and you did a pilot right in Charlotte for three Home Depots? That's right. So I, I ended up buying the manufacturing business out in Oklahoma called Mertz. Okay. We actually owned the business and manufactured the Boxer and a number of other oil field products. But, but in, uh, let's see, in 2007, when the world was starting to tighten up a little bit and uh, Home Depot was buying product from us, the powerhouse product, and they, they were smarter than me. They saw the, um, the downturn in the economy coming well ahead of me, but they, they started, you know, pulling back on their orders. Sure. And so I went to them and said, look, if you're not going to buy this stuff that I've already manufactured and built, I'd sure like to put it on your parking lot. And, uh, 
I'll own it and take all the risk and, and we'll share the rental. So, so they gave me a test in late um, 2007 that turned into a broader test over the course of 2008. And then at the end of 08, gave me the opportunity to expand it to a hundred stores, which we raised capital and did. And we ended up buying back everything we had sold them for their rental and then operating the entire outdoor towable rental business for the Home Depot. And then from uh, 2009 to 2017, we grew to 1100 locations where we owned the equipment on the parking lot and serviced and maintained that. We also had a, a service division that took care of all of their in-store equipment like uh, paint shakers and carpet carousels and saws and man lifts and shopping carts and that sort of thing. And so we had that contract for every Home Depot store in the United States, every Lowe's store in the United States and every Best Buy store. So we had 5,000 locations where we had sex uh, on the road on our payroll. We were maintaining all that inside equipment. So, so the equipment business became, you know, a significant business between service and rental. We had rental with the Home Depot and then service with all of those different retailers. How in the world did you set up 1,100 stores like that? How, uh, the, 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 how did you do that? Well, the simple answer is one at a time, right? <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, but, you were there every single one. Uh, you know, I didn't visit them all, but um, but I visited a lot of them, and and my team was at every store every week. So, um, and Home Depot had, is is a great business, by the way, and they were great partners. I can't say enough good about Home Depot as a company and their their culture, their their um, their, their values. You know, mm -hmm. doing the right thing is one of their core values, and they they lived up to that. So. Um, so having their platform, you know, I, what I had to do was get the equipment, get it there, get it ready to rent, get it on a trailer, get the trailer tagged, and then have the, the uh, support to maintain it and deliver it. So, you know, the, the real work was not so much in getting the store set up because I just had to get it on the parking lot. The real work was in putting those, those, um, resources and processes in place to deliver and maintain the equipment. And That's a huge undertaking, I can see. Well, was, what would you say your leadership style is? Uh, lead by consensus, I would say, Ed. Um, hmm. You know, I'm, uh, I'm not afraid of fiat when fiat is required, when you just have to make a decision and push it down. But, but man, when you, when you have a great team around you and you can develop the answers collectively and you can can all kind of stack hands. That was that's one of our comments is let's stack hands on this and then go do it. And so uh, I'd say definitely it's leading by developing consensus. Mm, it's, that's, that's wonderful. What about your strengths? What do you think your greatest strengths are? Well, I'm doggedly determined. So I'd say perseverance is, you know, is a, certainly a strength. Um, um, I like people, man, I, you know, and uh, it's funny. You get bad people, you come and interview people and, and, and they say, I like working with people. And I say, well, that's a good thing because that's all we've got here, right? <laughs> True. We, we don't have any animals that are that are managing uh, divisions or, or crew, running crews. So, so yeah, I mean, I, I think I've, I like, I understand, I believe, Ed, and she, you know, so I hate this kind of, uh, self-analysis probably. <laughs> I, I just, you know, I try to put myself in the other guy's shoes and, and, and not, and, and lead in a way that people want to do it rather than feel like they have to do it. I guess that's, mm -hmm. I had a strength. I put it there. And uh, I know, I know another strength you have too. And in our conversations in the past, you've mentioned it to me and that's an ability you have. All right, which one? <laughs> Refresh my memory. Well, that's you. You mentioned one thing about you. You always take the long view. Oh yeah. The other one is you see things in advance. You said it before when you saw that machine. You you said you said you saw that dingo. You you, you what yeah. happened? So looking, you know, looking out, looking down the road. And so let me share this with you. So. 
I have, I have a few guys who are CEOs that, that I'm coaching and uh, this is going to sound so simple. It's almost trite, but, but here's what I tell them. I said, there, there's five things that have to happen uh, in a business and you have to make sure they happen. They happen. It's, one is planning. So it's, it's all about where are we going? What's our strategy? What's our objectives? Who do we want to be? What's our vision? all the way down to what are we going to do this week and what's our 2021 budget and our five-year financial plan. I mean, there's all sorts of planning that has to happen, but you've got to do it. You've got to be intentional about all of that planning and mm -hmm. walk through a process. It, it, the next is selling, you know, and somebody's got to sell something and that's everything that's related to advertising, marketing, closing business, making proposals, you know, everything that relates to, to selling. The third is doing, so once you've sold it, you got to do it. It's, it's all about your operations and, and all about um, all the activities in your business. The, the, the fourth is, is tracking. So you've got to report on it. You've got to report to the government, to the banks, to your employees. You got to have, you know, the, the KPI reporting that tells you how you're performing. There's all sorts of reporting issues, but tracking is the fourth and the fifth is, is telling. And so it's the communication side of uh, what you're doing, communicating to your team, communicating to your trade partners, your banks, the, the outside world, your customers, the community at large. There's, there's a big job in telling. So I, it's plan, sell, do, track, tell. And the good CEOs and leaders end up, I find, reaching a point where they're spending most of their time on planning and telling and they typically have other leaders who are focused on selling, doing, and tracking. So, so at Compact, we had a chief development officer, a chief operating officer, chief development had selling, chief, chief operating had doing, and chief financial had tracking. And I was the CEO and I spent most of my time on, on planning and telling. So make, you know, the planning and the communications, they were all involved in all of that, of course, but yeah. and I never, never took my hand off the other three entirely, but, but uh, as you're, those of you who are leaders, think about that plan, sell, do, track, tell. And as your business grows, try to get yourself into uh, a position where you're mostly planning and telling, communicating. So, mm -hmm. And now um, I noticed you only had five. How come you didn't have six, Roger? Because <laughs> I only have five fingers. Ed. So, <laughs> so, so we, we have a rule around my shops, which is uh, uh, you cannot, cannot, cannot have more than five things no more than five bullet points, no more than five initiatives, no more than five things to focus on. And three is better. If you can get it to three, that's better. And, and, uh, and of the three, there's usually one that's, that's preeminent, right? That's the most important thing and figure out what that is and be really good at it. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. Mark asks here, uh, what skill sets do you look for in your team members and how do you, uh, how do you help develop them? Okay. So that's, there's a lot, a lot to unpack that. So yeah. I'll try to give a, a full semester without taking the rest of the day with that one. But so uh, I look for good communication skills, somebody who can synthesize something and, and get it down to what matters. If someone kind of runs off in 10 different directions in their conversation with me, I probably, you know, don't, don't want that person. They need to be able to focus in, answer the question, be specific. Uh, I look for people who uh, who present well. You know, one of our core values in all of my businesses has been professionalism, and so if they if they can't present themselves in a professional way, probably don't want them. I, by the way, we we would rate interviewees on how how we perceive they fit with our seven core values, and so uh, so we when we got through, we actually had a little little work chart where we would rate them one to ten on each of the seven core values and didn't stack up well against our core values, we, we wouldn't hire them because then we're just going to have to get them off the bus later. Um, so, but I, here's one particular thing that I often say is particularly if I'm hiring someone to take on an objective of some sort, uh, I want someone who looks at that and says, Oh yeah, I got that. I know how to do that. I, you know, if, if you hire somebody and the objective looks really hard to them, it's probably going to be really hard. And if you hire someone that the objective looks easy or you don't want it to be too easy, but you, you know, doable. Yeah. Then I'd say, boy, they're probably the right guy or gal for the job. Yeah. 
That's great. That's great. Good, good advice. Really, really good advice. Uh, have you, uh, did you grow any of these companies by acquisition, especially your landscape side? Because you have a lot of landscapers listening. Yeah. So, uh, you know, obviously Landcare, we, we bought 70 companies in two years. So, so between uh, Service Master and Landcare. So that was a, a um, you know, drink from a fire hose on acquisition there. Uh, it, so, you know, for example, in, in my landscape business, we bought a sod farm a few years ago. We bought another sod farm this year. And so I, I've tried to make some, some more strategic acquisitions to bring skills and resources in that would take perhaps a long time to develop or that we didn't have. But I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm frankly not a super big fan on roll up for roll up sake and, and just scale for scale sake. Uh, and you know that's that's kind of a a um, a financial engineering strategy, and I participated in the first big one in the landscape business. And and if you ask me, you know, five years later how I felt about it, I would say, well, you know, a lot of entre entrepreneurs made some money, and that's good. But um, uh, I wasn't crazy about how it all turned out in the long run, in terms mm -hmm. of you know. Yeah, I was with you there. I know. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this. Um, uh, now, be careful with this one. Now, think hard. Now, did you use consultants <laughs> in your company? Oh, yes. Uh, yes. Um, I was uh, thinking. You mentioned uh, George Coziars earlier, and back in the day, George was a, you know, kind of one of the first really visionary consultants out there who, who could help a company uh, go from good to great and go from kind of stumbling along to really going with a plan. So when it came to planning, George was my first coach and I owe him a lot, a lot, a real debt of gratitude for sitting in my basement till midnight and one o'clock in the morning, you know, helping me run numbers and teaching me about Excel spreadsheets and, and uh, you know, planning by month for multiple years out in front of us. And, and I remember in one of those sessions, George saying, Hey, I want to show you this, great thing I've gotten involved in. It's called the internet. You, 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 and I can't believe all you can do and I, all the people you can connect with. And I thought, Oh yeah, that's great. That's not going anywhere. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, yeah, I used a lot of consultants along the way and, and thank God for them. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. We like the, we appreciate the plug Roger. <laughs> so, you just can't do that, right? It's no, no shame in not having all the answers. The shame is not getting them. Right. Now you you are a really a self-taught man. You didn't have formal education, right? So let me ask you this: Do you read much? Yeah. Yes. Yes. I, I have read a lot in my life, and and uh, gained a lot from it. I see somebody asked, "What are your top three business books?" Uh, you know, I remember the one that really had a ton of impact on me back in the day was "In Search of Excellence" by Tom Peters. That was kind of you know, a whole new uh, way of thinking for me. And um, Colin's books, Good to Great and Great by Choice, those are really highly recommend Collins. He's, he's brilliant and, uh, and gives you actionable, you know, uh, actionable impact. I like Sinex books, you know, Begin With Why and, and uh, Eaters, I mean, Leaders Eat Last is yeah. a great book by Simon Sinek. Uh, I, I love watching him on uh, YouTube at night. Yeah, I, I, I listen. I watch a lot of him. He, he's really, really fantastic. Yeah, he's a really smart guy. Yeah. What, yeah. what do you enjoy doing? Yeah, I mean, be out of out of work. Yeah. So I know you love that. Yeah. Um, I'm. You know, I play some golf, but I'm not crazy. I'm not a giant golfer. I, I uh, have a home in the mountains of North Carolina where I kind of get away to. And my wife and I spent most of the year there during COVID in 2020 because it was very convenient to kind of hang out and hide there and, and do zoom all day <laughs> and uh, and the golf course is nearby so we could slip off there so uh, it's a place called high meadows country club i'm on the board there so if anybody's looking for a retreat in the mountains of north carolina we'd love to have you talk to me i'm the membership chairman i'm happy to, <laughs> to sign you up love to have you plug but, plug, plug i got it yeah. <laughs> it's, vacations it's, did you always did you always take vacations during uh your busy, your busy periods. 
<laughs> you know, I, we always took vacations at some point during the year. Thanks to my wife, it'd been up to me. I probably would have just kept my head down and worked all the time, but I have to give my wife credit for sort of, um, you know, making sure that, that there was time created to create some memories for our family. And so, you know, I was having a conversation at seven o'clock this morning with the uh, HR uh, director and she's, she's director of HR and legal compliance for Southern Chaytree. She has, has three young sons. Um, I think the oldest is eight and the youngest is two. And her husband's building a business, um, uh, his own business in Atlanta, doing a great job. She was just saying that, you know, it just takes so much effort and time to build a business and to, and to, to have an, you know, a significant executive role in a company. Either of those take a lot of time and, uh, and how they were struggling to find the time, you know, to, to play, um, what was it? Paw Patrol, for example, with the boys. It's like, you know, you go from worrying about a, a private equity transaction on the one end to playing Paw Patrol with your son on the other. And, uh, but you got you just have to be present for them or you miss such a great opportunity to create memories for you and for them and so i just encourage everybody on the call to uh so here this is quick I, I read an article about a guy who when he was about 45 i think or 50 he recognized that he was working every saturday and that saturday should be a gift to his family mm. and, so he went and he figured that how old how many saturdays were between then and the time he was 70. So let's say it's 25 years and call it 50 a year. So that's what 1,250 Saturdays or something. So he, so he put that many pennies in a jar and every Saturday he took a penny out of that jar and he watched the jar go down, you know, year after year after year as he was mm. taking a penny out every Saturday. And it reminded him of how important that time was to spend it with his family and spend it in a way that he wouldn't regret it later. And that's, I read that. And by the way, he said when he got to 70, he started putting a penny back in every Saturday because that was a bonus as he saw it. Now he was no, in the bonus. That's story, right? so that's I read that. And that's when I quit working on Saturdays and started, you know, doing things with my family on Saturday. So I'd that's recommend great it. Story, great stories. Yeah. Well put. Uh, what are your worries today? Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> well, do you really want to know? Because well, the, the last week. The last week, one, the last week is keeping me up at night. So you know, um, I, you know, you worry about you worry about the division in our nation. I, I I really worry about the division in our nation and 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 the lack of civil discourse and the lack of um, respect for different opinions and uh, and how we re respond to different opinions. I, I was. It hasn't been too long ago, and I, I won't go into the details. But I was at I was at dinner with someone who I knew pretty well socially, and and uh, and a political discussion came up, and and um, and my opinion wasn't exactly what his was, and he told his wife we we need to truncate this conversation. Got up, walked out of the room. Really? <laughs> what did this? What happened here? You know? And and of course, maybe that was better than having an argument. So I give him credit for that. But but. Uh, you know, it's, um, I, I just really worry about that part of our country. So I don't, you know, I guess all of us can start by just being kind to each other and, and thoughtful and, and respectful. And whether we're a different race or different creed or different, different political, you know, mind, we can certainly respect each other. So hopefully, hopefully we'll see some return to that. Yeah. Good, good, good show. Let, let me ask you this. Um, this is top secret now, so don't tell anybody, okay? But um, how do you get so much done in a day, Roger? Um, man, I just have the most amazing partners and people who are so incredibly competent that, uh, you know, I just give them my thoughts and ideas and course correct a little bit here and there when they want me to. And and um, and I have an amazing uh, executive assistant and. Carrie Crocker, who, um, you know, is always handling things that I don't have to handle. And uh, so I, it's, it's about the people, you know, it's about the people. Now you've got to, you got to dig in and do your part, right? You, you know, you've got to do your part, but uh, I, I'd say it's just getting the right people in, really. It's yeah. Yeah. So, and, so true. Now you still have your landscape company going full bore. Isn't that true? And your tree in the tree. 
Yeah, so uh, and I have uh, have partners who run it, um, and um, uh, I'm not the president of the business. I'm on the board. How large is the company, Roger? Uh, I think they will do um, about 26. Did about 26 million in 2020. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And, and how it, do you keep in touch with them? To us, well, do board meetings first thing. So there's a there's a quarterly board meeting, and there's a certain you know list of reports they have to bring to that and present and and uh, but i'm also available for a phone call at any time there needs to be one and then i have started more recently in that we've been in an expansion mode and bought us a, a large side farm that i've been um, doing a a one hour call from 11 to 12 on monday morning and uh, mm -hmm. zoom call and, and by the way i'd say that's something zoom has taught us that we can do a lot that we didn't think we could do you know mm -hmm. these these the team, the leadership team is in about four different places uh, on a Monday morning at 11 o'clock or sometimes five or six if a couple of guys are calling from the vehicle. But to have an in-person meeting was just too too disruptive and problematic. We never did it uh, at that time, you know, once a week on a Monday. But now with Zoom, we can all be face to face for an hour, get a ton mm -hmm. and, and have a really useful meeting. And so, uh, so I do spend an hour a week on that call. And, and how do the how does the company make decisions? I mean, I know they can contact you, but do you just let them make decisions on their own? Uh, well, so I have a president. We have um, you know um, three vice presidents. We have a couple of directors and a finance director and HR director, and and they all have a sphere in which they make the decisions. They don't tell me about the decision. They don't push something to the board level that's operational. Uh, you know, there's there's a limit to how much money they might spend on their own and that, that sort of thing, what they might commit the company to, but they but the VPs have the right to commit the, the company to, you know, contracts for half a million bucks. So um, they have yeah. a tremendous amount of authority and and, and of control. I know they just made a fairly uh, large decision on the software that uh, your company uses, and that's a big one. Yeah. Uh, did they make that on their own? Uh, that decision was uh, was made at the senior management and board level. So, so uh, the, the board didn't force it on senior management. The senior management uh, came together, heard the presentation, you know, had follow-on meetings and caucus together, and decided they, that's what they wanted to do, and and then you know presented the 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 plan to the board, and it was approved and. So they, they took on boss last year and are making great progress and getting great results. And uh, yeah, so we, we have to figure out, we just bought the sod business. And the next big thing is to, to figure out how to, to integrate the sod business, which is quite different from the landscape business, but how to integrate that into the, the information system. We'll get there. Yep. We've been promised, promised help by Integra, so we'll, we'll get there. Okay, that's great. I'm sure they'll come through. Yes. And tell me, um, I know your family has been very important to you. As you just mentioned, you took Saturdays off to be with your family. Tell, uh, tell everybody about a milestone that you achieved last year. Okay. So my wife, Teresa, and I were married on June 6th of 1970. So we celebrated 50 years together in June and, and, uh, still going strong in year 51. And, uh, <laughs> I still like her a lot. <laughs> she puts up with me well, so I love her a lot. So yeah, so we have one daughter, Angela, who's, who's on the board of Southern Shade Company and is um, uh, executive director of Give Hope Global and co-founder of Give Hope Global with me. So yeah. she has four four kids, three boys and a daughter. The daughter's at Wofford, 20 years old. The boys are 12, 15 and 17 and all heavily involved in basketball. So it's all good. Yeah. That's awesome. I'm sure you're heavily involved with them as well. Yeah, number. I had one boy that scored 18 last night, one scored 21 in separate Good games. He, <laughs> he knows the stats, folks. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. fantastic. T tell me, um, uh, I know you're a spiritual person too. Yeah, so I mean, look, uh, I've, I don't have my faith. I'm, I'm thankful. That I'm a I'm a Christian and and uh, that after having spent a few years 
uh, as a non-believer, I uh, placed my faith in Christ in, in 1980, mm -hmm. and uh, my life has never been the same since. And I uh, continue to to be amazed at, um, at at the grace that we that we've been extended through Him. So uh, I don't force it on folks, but I'm always happy to talk about it and. And uh, for me, it is the only logical solution to why in the world am I here? And, and uh, it, if you dig deep enough, and study well enough, as C.S. Lewis said, it's the only logical solution to it. So, mm -hmm. but, you know, I'm, I won't use your platform to, to promote it, but that's where I am. So. Well, I do want you to um, use this platform to talk about your charity, the charity you started. Tell everyone about that. Yeah, so... Um, and, and uh, let's see, it's been 11 years ago now, 2010, January of 2010, there was a huge earthquake in Haiti and a tremendous amount of damage, a few hundred thousand people killed, country set back for, for years and years. My daughter lived beside a doctor who went down after the earthquake and worked and came back personally transformed by the experience, was going back with a second group of doctors, invited her to go as journalists. She did that. She came back transformed by the experience and invited me to go co-lead a team of doctors in January of 2012 mm. who were going back. And so as a, as a means to check mission trip off my bucket list and to spend a week with my grown daughter, who I rarely got to spend time with, I said yes and um, went down and, and um, you know ran into a bunch of 165 kids that were severely malnourished in an underfunded orphanage and uh, couldn't come back and, you know, go back to, to work like normal and let that go. So got together a bunch of people to, to solve that problem and to, to meet the financial need. And that's turned into a, an organization called Give Hope Global that is working in Haiti and in Ghana in the areas of education and, and community health. Um, and uh, and trying to create jobs, uh, so we're all those a lot of those little kids that were you know 10, 11, 12 years old back then are now in college. I have two in uh, in um, medical university in Port-au-Prince are going to be doctors. I have um, <coughs> two here in the states who are playing um, college soccer, one at uh, Gardner Webb and one at University of South Carolina. Uh, brilliant young men who, who are making their way in the world. I have. Um, a good number in, in college in, uh, in Lakai, which is the Haitian city in which we're located and work there. We have two transition homes for young high schoolers, that young men that are 18 to 25, with 50, 25 each in the transition homes. And uh, now we have a model farm. Um, we have a thing called Shop Hope Global that brings product in from Haiti and, and sells it here in the United States. That's shophopeglobal.org. You can find us at givehopeglobal.org. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm scheduled to take 18 people there in January. If, if I can figure out how to get back into the country with this new travel rule. Yeah. That is <laughs> it just came out last night. So, yeah. Yeah. So, so it's a school. You started a school. And what grades are the school? Well, there's actually several schools. In Ghana, we have uh, kindergarten through eighth grade, 225 students. In Haiti, we have a high school with 900 students, Ooh. and we have a primary school with 100, and we have an online school that has 90 students enrolled in that too, so that we provide the content and the, and the technology for. So instead uh, of uh, giving them the fish, you're teaching them how to fish. Exactly, and doing our best. You know. It's it. You'd have to go to Haiti to really appreciate the, the circumstances, uh, Ed, and all of you on the call. It's, you know, in this country, there's there's some way you can make it. You can get yourself a job or two, and get get a little capital and get started and start a business. And there's enough money going around to uh, it, you know to to make it work. In Haiti, it's really tough to to find you know a way to make enough money. When there's not a lot of money there, right, and uh, uh, and so it's it's a, it's a challenge. But we figure that the kids who speak English and no technology and have a have a degree are far better off than those who don't. And so our effort is to is to improve their odds, do all we can to improve their odds, and give them as many tools as we can to work with.
important. We can't, we can't, you know, absolutely uh, guarantee the the outcomes for them, but we can improve their odds for a good outcome. And so that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, that's fantastic. fantastic. It's got to be really rewarding for you uh, to do that. Um, uh, you know, there's young there's a young girl who really changed my life. Her name's Ernice E R N I S E. And so on my first trip there, she pushed my hand into her belly and said, Roger, I'm hungry. And, and her belly was like a sponge, you know. And that, that's when I realized the doctor said, look, 90% of these kids would be hospitalized if they're in the United States. She was 12. Now she's 21. Last year she came. She comes to the States quite a lot now. And, and we'll go to college here, hopefully next year. But uh, she came and spoke to our annual gala, got up in front of 400 people, dressed to the nines, looked, you know, like a million dollars, spoke perfect English, uh, which she's learned since we've been there, and speaks English, Creole, French, and Spanish. Cool. By the way, brilliant kid. And to, and to see her go from starving to that is like, I don't know, I can't describe it. <laughs> I can't describe it. It's too good. Yeah, yeah. amazing. So, that is so fantastic. And if, um, if the folks want to contribute uh, to the organization, they just go to? Uh, GiveHopeGlobal.org. GiveHopeGlobal.org. There's a lot of Give Hope, so it is, be sure you get that right. It's GiveHopeGlobal, G-L-O-B-A-L, dot O-R-G. Let me can... just put it on the, uh, on the chat so everybody can see it. Yeah. And shophopeglobal.org is the store. And uh, by the way, I would tell you that uh, the hoodies with Give Hope on them are like crazy uh, attractive. And, and there's at least a couple of high schools in Charlotte where the boys are all wearing the, the pink Give Hope hoodies. And if you're man enough to wear that <laughs> Give Hope hoodie, I guarantee you people will notice you. So That is awesome. Awesome. Uh, when it would the uh, Gallen said uh, he's asking who are your mentors? Okay, um, so uh, that's a that's a good question. I would say that um, my first mentor was a guy named Ralph Boone who started the Southern Shade Tree Company, and it was the first. I mean, other than my dad, who was who was a great friend and mentor, and and taught me how to work, and you know, taught me to, to load a wheelbarrow towards the front and not so much on the back. So that it was easy to pick it up and how to put my body into a shovel and, and how to dig a hole. And I could go on and on. I, I think I should write a book on stuff that B.I. Braswell taught me. I think I could write a book on it. So I was, I was blessed in that regard. But the first business mentor was Ralph Boone, who was the founder of the Southern Shade Tree Company. Hmm. So he had enough trust in me to sell me that business at the age of 24. On, on, and he financed it. So he needed to mentor me to be sure I paid him. <laughs> <laughs> Smart so, guy. <laughs> yeah, so Ralph took me under his wing and, and uh, taught me a ton about business and managing guy, men and, and all of that. So unfortunately, we lost him in 2004 and, uh, and he's passed. But I would say he was, he was my first, first mentor. I've had a number of spiritual mentors who've been pastors that, that, I've, that I've worked with. But business-wise, probably Ralph. I'd say George Koziars was definitely a mentor to me in a big way on, on the whole planning side of business and, uh, and financing business. Um, I have a close friend who is um, uh, Steve Cook, who is, um, uh, has a business called Fieldstone Partners. And Steve and I collaborated on, I think, 16 different private equity transactions, either some that I was involved with and some that he was involved with. Uh, and we're on, on a couple of boards together. So um, Steve's a brilliant guy and has been a good mentor. Bill Murdy was a bit of a mentor to me. He was the CEO of Landcare and has been on, on a number of my boards and I've invested in some of his uh, uh, ventures and he continues to be. Bill's a West Point grad, brilliant man and uh, been a great, uh, business mentor to me. Does Bill still live in New Canaan? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Sure does. Still, still on the move a lot, and he's over at West Point. He owns the uh, the hotel, the Thayer Hotel. There, as you enter West Point, and he has the Thayer Leadership Center, which is a leadership development uh, operation that they operate out of the hotel there. Yeah. 
using West Point principles. By the way, I don't know if you know what a uh, what a distinguished graduate of West Point is, but less than one half of one percent of the graduates from West Point ever achieve the 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 prestige and the honor of being designated a distinguished distinguished graduate. And Bill received that award a couple of years ago, and so he wow. speaks speaks a lot about the kind of man he is and and the kind of life he's led. Yeah, the success. I've had, I've had yeah. lunch with him, and he's he's a great guy. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah, those guys have all been big blessings to me. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's think about the future. One thing that's on everyone's mind is what, what do you think, as far as, as far as landscapers are concerned, what do you think um, uh, this year and next year holds for land, the landscape industry? Um, so um, after I answer this, I want to answer Ben's questions about trucks, by the way, too. Okay, so. okay. Um, so, you know, let's, let's go back to March or, or February. I, I um, woke up one day and COVID was the reality and I called my partner at Southern. I said, man, we need to get this team together and figure out how we're going to respond. So, you know, we put together a, um, a low cost plan and I, a, what happens when all our customers, you know, stop having us do all these new homes we're doing, et cetera and stop building these developments and it never happened <laughs> you know we we were prepared for the worst and in fact we ended up having the best year ever yeah. so uh, you know they just kept of course we're in the carolinas and people just kept coming and buying houses and there was never enough homes to sell and uh, it was a, it was a banner banner year in the carolinas for for real estate sales so uh and so what I thought was going to happen didn't happen here. And so now I'm fairly bullish on, on at least the two Carolinas, which is all that we, we focus on. Um, but I also found that um, on the maintenance side of business, um, people cert we certainly did not have the level of enhancements that we, were, that we budgeted for. In fact, the only part of the budget we missed in 2020 was the enhancement in maintenance. Hmm. Everything else we exceeded plan, but in maintenance we we missed the enhancements, you know, handily. So I think, you know, and a lot of those would have been properties where they were feeling some impact from shutdown or office closings and people working from home and those kinds of things. And so I, I would I would say that people are going to continue to be a little careful about um, you know unnecessary expenses, mm -hmm. and so. I would probably not, we we dialed back the enhancement plan for 21 considerably from what it was for 20. I'll tell you what though, Roger, uh, it could be that maybe they need some training. So uh, after this, I'm gonna send you the Harvest Account Manager training course. Oh, good. And the first, good. the first module is how to sell enhancement work. How's that? Good. <laughs> <laughs> well, we just in parens in a COVID environment. <laughs> No problem. We could for sure. <laughs> I'd love to have a lesson on I'll, that. <laughs> let, let's get it because, you know, the other side of that is you're so right. There's so many things that you, you just can't let it happen to you. You got to take it. You, know, you got to make it happen on your own. So, yeah, if there's no advice in a COVID environment. So, by the way, everybody that I talk to tells me that this run is not over, that we're going to get through this transition and and. Uh, yeah, we're going to probably see some tax rate changes and the new administration and the new Congress will have the ability to to move the needle some there, but that there's still a run left. And so I, I'm bullish. I wouldn't encourage any of you to go spend money because I said I'm bullish, but, but you know, I, I'm feeling pretty good about it. I, I Look, I've been in this business now for 52 years and I've seen, you know, fuel shortages and I've seen riots and I've seen, you know, also the, the towers, you know, all of that. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and this, this business has just kept growing and growing and growing. This industry kept growing and growing. And, and um, so I guess after 52 years, I find it hard to believe that it's not going to just keep growing and growing. So I, for sure, you know, uh, um, one of the uh, questions that came through and I had it in mind to ask you too is what advice would you give a brand new company owner? 
Well, a brand new company owner, I'd say, you know, get some advice. <laughs> that would be one thing, you know, um, get it, jo join trade association, uh, you know, fi find a good advisor that can, can give you some advice. See if you can get a, a, an industry member to mentor you a bit. Uh, Cause there's just so much you have to learn the hard way that you wouldn't have to learn the hard way. If you paid for a little advice or you, um, I found some people to, to, you know, help you along. So that'd be my first advice would be to get some, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Sure. For uh, sure. Hey, so there was a question up about trucks. I'm going to yeah. jump. Yeah, we were going to talk about that. Yeah. Um, the question was, uh, I think you said, would you buy new lightly used or keep fixing the old stuff? And so, and, and I think that was how it was mentioned. And so, so Ben, I would say that's the last thing I would do. And I've done it is to keep fixing the old stuff. Uh, but boy, the cost of fixing the old stuff is really, really high. And I'm not just talking about transmissions and engines and fuel pumps and, and, and um, rear ends and all of that. I'm talking about the, the, the cost in your business of the downtime for your people and the, and the morale impact. There's, a, there's an old saying that if you want to improve morale, just improve the contingencies of the workplace environment. And for landscape contractors, man, the biggest contingency is, is the truck going to get me there? You know, when the trucks break down, it just, everything goes out the window. Morale goes out the window. Timing goes out the window. Customer satisfaction goes out the window. And, um, uh, and so, you know, I, I remember at one point in time, I, rounded up a ton of used equipment and, and went and sold it simultaneous with leasing a bunch of new trucks. And so it was like the biggest shot in the arm for my business. And I'm not telling you all to run out and necessarily do that, but, but I got cash in the business because the trucks were paid for and the equipment I sold was paid for. So that was fresh capital in the business. And then when I leased the new trucks, I didn't have to put the cash out because I didn't have to make a down on the lease. And so I, I had new trucks and cash kind of one, one, one fell swoop. And, uh, and both were really helpful to my productivity and my operating efficiency and the morale right across my company. And, uh, and so, uh, and by the way, I'm, I am a fan of, of buying really good used trucks that are lightly used and, and you maybe even still, kind of in the warranty phase where you can buy a deal on those because you can save a lot of money and, and it's just like a new truck to your guys. But, but the old ones that are breaking down, you need to get them out of your fleet if you can. Soon as, sooner the better. So. Good advice. Good advice. Uh, I don't think the folks know, we, we uh, haven't talked about this yet. I don't think they know that you were uh, president of the local, the state organization and served a number of different roles. We have just a few minutes. Could you just talk about that? Yeah, so I mean, I was um, I was a director of the North Carolina Landscape Contractors Association, then president. I was a member of the Landscape Contractors Registration Board, then chairman. I was the director of ALCA back in the day, director of um, the GIE show, and uh, and you know those things take time. They take a little money. You have to go places, and but you can take your wife and make you know make some fun out of it, and and. Uh, and kind of get a little vacation that the company pays for legitimately. So it's not all bad, but um, man, what I learned from just being around other people and the stuff I picked up and the things I learned at, at those meetings and trade shows, uh, it was like, it, it didn't cost me, it paid right to do that. So I'd really encourage people to get involved in, in their organizations and trade, trade groups and, you know, get, help somebody else, by the way, I've never helped anybody that didn't come back to me in some way that, that I didn't see coming. So cast your bread on the waters and it'll come back to you in many days. So, yeah. Well, I'll tell you, um, uh, we're, we're about uh, out of time. Ah. Uh, is there anything that uh, you'd like to uh, say to the folks before we conclude? Yeah. By the way, the name of that author is Simon Sinek. Oh, yeah. Simon Sinek. I think it's S Y N E K. I see a question. Yeah. Um, but, um, <clears throat> Yes. Uh, here's, here's the thing, by the way, I'd like to say this. So um, I believe that one of the greatest uh, gifts that we've received as humans 
is our ability to, to create something that doesn't yet exist. And, and you know, the, the God that I serve and worship is a creator. That's what he does. He's a creator. He created me, this universe. And, and so, so what a great gift to give us the ability to, to see something in our mind's eye that doesn't yet exist and then go make it become real. And that's what you're all doing with your businesses is, uh, is you're seeing something that doesn't yet exist. And then you're going out and making it real. You know, we get the ultimate opportunity to do that with children. What a, what a great, what a great gift to create a child. I hear you talk about your son every time I talk to you, Ed. <laughs> oh, right? I mean, I'm proud. You know, yeah. Of course you are. And you hear me talk about my grandsons and grand granddaughter and my daughter. And, and, uh, and so, and the business is something like that. You get to, um, you get to envision something and go out and through your own sweat and hard work and ingenuity, make it come into existence. That's an incredible gift. And if you figure out how to give that gift to your team members, you know, so that it's not all you, it's not all coming out of your brain, at least let some of it come out of their brain and then help them bring it into reality or give them the freedom to bring it into reality. Man, they'll love it and they'll want to be a part of what you're doing. And so that's, if I have anything to leave you with, it's to nurture that gift of cre creation, of creativity, mm. to be able to put something come into existence. And, you know, I have a few titles, but, but when my title on, on a business or an organization is founder or co founder, you know, that means you were there at the start. And, and that's the one I like the best. So, love anyway. it. Love it. Well, thank you so much for taking the time, Roger. I think uh, all of our group really appreciate it. And uh, I'll tell you one thing. I think you're still having fun at this. That's for sure. I can feel it. I am. I am. You know what? I can't wait to get up tomorrow and go do something different. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you, Roger. That was, uh, that was wonderful, inspirational. And, um, you know, it's just lots of great insight. And I know that from the comments that we've been seeing that uh, – you shared a lot of, um, you connected with a lot of our attendees, which is awesome. Good. So we want to thank, you know, Roger for his generous use of his time and thank all of our attendees for joining us today. Uh, we appreciate that. And we encourage everybody to, um, well, before I say that, I want to remind you that we will send out a copy of the recording. So everybody who registered for this um, conversation series will get a copy of the recording. So you get that in the next, you know, 24 to 48 hours. So we can, we can replay this, Roger, over and over. <laughs> um, Meanwhile, I'll make my wife listen to it. <laughs> there, you, there you go. So, so um, we do this because, um, you know, we love the landscape business and we just really want to help you harvest your potential. So hopefully you learned something today and we'll see you next time. Take care. Enjoy today. Take care, Roger. Thanks. Yeah, bye-bye. We'll be in touch. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.